So this morning I want to share with you on the inestimable, inestimable value of, of prayer or the immeasurable value of prayer. Immeasurable value of prayer. And I want to read again from Luke 5.16. Luke 5.16. That was a verse that I read when I came up the first time during the bridge and I would read it again. Actually, I'll read from verse 15. However, the report went around concerning him all the more. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So here were a, a large crowd of people who would come to hear him because they already heard about him. A large crowd of people, multitude, the Bible said, came because they heard. So there was an advertising going on by people who had experienced him and others who wanted to have the experience or who had experienced him before came together to hear him again. And then we see a surprising thing. See, Jesus is not a politician because I'm sure if he's a politician, he would go back for that crowd, right? That means more votes. That means a secure mandate for, uh, you know, for the government. But Jesus withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Ah, and I looked at it and I said to myself, huh, he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and then he wasn't just there watching birds or whatever. He actually did something. The Bible says, and he prayed. And like I said earlier, I'm wondering, um, if this man was the son of God, if he had so much power, we've seen that power demonstrated, why did he need to pray? And I've said many times, and I'll say it again, if there's anything that the enemy fights in our lives, it's prayer. There's anything that the enemy fights in our life. It's your ability to pray as an individual. Tell me here. Is there anybody who struggles when it comes to prayer? Like, yeah. But is it that you don't want to pray? It's not that. You know what? You know that it's good for... Even when... Okay, so how many of us, when you go to a prayer meeting, or when you have a personal time of prayer, feel good afterwards? It's like, oh, this is great. But well, if you go to a restaurant that is good, you probably go back there. Now, I don't like most seafood not that there's anything wrong with it but i just don't i'm not a seafood person the fact that i'm eating a crab you know and then you have to you have this metal things that you have to use to break I mean, no, there's, it's, they bring it to you and like what are we killing somebody here why do you have all these things but my wife loves that kind of food and she will be breaking crack, 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 and sucking and eating <laughs> And I'm just dying on the other side of the table. But she's been saying, I want to go to Red Lobster. For seven years. And I said, you can go alone. I love you, but please go alone. But after you have been married for a long time, if your wife can't influence you, honestly, you are probably close to the devil. <laughs> I said, all right, we will go to Red Lobster. So this year, we drove all the way from East St. Paul to, uh, there's one Red Lobster in the city. You probably know where that. Who's been to Red Lobster? And I hear that they have the best uh, biscuits in this. Because I Googled, I went to, I was just looking for somebody to tell me how bad it smells from seafood. Instead, I saw people talking about this amazing biscuit. And I like biscuits. So we went, and I thought, okay. So we, as soon as we entered, I almost turned around. <laughs> but I just said, all right. And, and the first thing is, there's a big, uh, 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 yeah, is it lobster or crab or whatever? Yeah, lobster, right? There's a big aquarium. And you see these things, and kids are looking at it. I'm like, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> so we sat there. We had a good time. I did that. Because one, the value of our relationship. And after then, the F Father's Day, she said, where would you like to go? I said, guess where? Red Lobster. 
So I went back there. But it took me a long time to go to that, I mean, to, 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 to go to Red Lobster with her. And we enjoyed it. I really, I mean, I, I, I didn't eat any, like I told them, don't put this on my own because everything there has shrimp and uh, just don't. So I removed what I didn't want. I said, even if, you, if I have to pay like, it was a, like there was shrimp in it, I'll pay. But just don't put shrimp. Don't put this, I don't eat this and that. Now, I'm not very picky. I can eat anything, you know, like, you know, except shrimp. <laughs> so you, you, you have to, for, for, for me, it was, it had to be, my wife had to be that important. I know some of you think, but it took you so long. Yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> but, but I eventually did it. Yeah, I got to a point. I said, my, my, we've been married for so long. It's been 22, 23 years. Come on. Go there. Whatever would happen. If you have, I, I'm, it's not like I'm allergic or that my face breaks out in sweat or what. No. It's just that there's a way it smells. I don't know if there's anybody here who feels that way. <laughs> I'm sorry for those of you who really go with your shrimp. It's just, that's just me, right? So I, I found myself really... Yeah, yeah, I did that because of the value I placed on it. So we're talking about the immeasurable value, the inestimable value of prayer. So we see in Luke 5, 16 how he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and, pray, and prayed. Somebody who had, I mean, he had, he had it in the bag. He was anointed. He could speak the way he was gifted. He had everything. But he often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. And I began to look closely at Jesus' life and wonder, what was it about him. What was it that what 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 was it about prayer that made him to pursue prayer like this? Because the Bible says often, and if you've read the scripture, the New Testament, you find that Jesus was always he would uh, Matthew fourteen twenty three. The Bible says he went up to a mountain and he was there alone uh, he, all night. And there was another verse in I think um, uh, 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 where it says that he spent all night in prayer to God. And I'm saying to myself, wow, what is this about prayer that Jesus was known to be a person of prayer? And I realized certain things. We're looking at the value. So I, I want to give you seven points, I believe. And uh, here are some of the reasons why I think he did what he did. And why you and I must do the same. Why we must raise our value. And I realize also that we tend to forget. If you are taught about how valuable something is, sometimes you forget. If you are taught about how valuable marriage is, sometimes we forget. And then we get into fights. If we, uh, you know, if we, uh, uh, we've, we've learned about how you know, important and valuable it is to be uh, you know, firm with our children over certain things, and uh, we sometimes forget. It's just human to forget. In the same way, I think that as Christians, there's times where uh, we also forget the value of prayer, and then we leave it. We just don't get engaged in it. Prayer is something that we have to be intentional about. We have to pray in season and out of season. Okay, so here are, are some reasons. The first one is this. The first one, why? Because I'm, I'm watching Jesus, right? The Bible says that he's our example. So I go closer to him. I watch his family life. I watch everything. You know, when you begin to meditate on the life of Jesus, try to paint a picture of the shop where he worked with Joseph the carpenter, his father, his foster father. Try to think of, you know, uh, where he lived in the house with Mary, his mother. Try to look at the kitchen, the bedrooms, the, you know, maybe you can add an upstairs. You know how, you know, these games nowadays where you can actually b put yourself in there and you, you have clothes and you, I don't play them, but I, I know I see people doing it. And, you know, imagine like that. Go back in time and see and then apply yourself in there and watch. This is what I do. And it's very powerful because it, it, it gives you a picture. The first thing, and I try to uh, list them in, not in, in, in a certain order so we can link them. The first thing I find is that Jesus... Jesus uh, really faced rejection, rejection, rejection. And rejection, if you as a Christian face rejection, the best place to go is into the presence of the one who accepts you the way you are. And Jesus I mean, when you look at what happened in John chapter 7, verse 3 to 6, and I'm going to read a few scriptures today. We'll put them up there. Hope, hopefully, we can put them all up there. John chapter, all from the New King James Version. John chapter 7 and verse uh, 3 to 6. John 7, 3 to 6. It says, uh, his brothers therefore said to him, this is Jesus' brothers, right? The, the biological children of Mary and Joseph. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea, and your disciples also 
that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5. For even his brothers did not believe in him. That's a dilemma. So if you live in a home and your people say you, ha- you are gifted for sports and your, 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 your siblings are always poking fun at you, you don't feel good because, I mean, you are, you are home most, you spend more time with your family than anywhere else. How many of us need family support here? You know how important that is. You know how much our, pe- our children love for us to watch their games and tell us they played well, even when sometimes they didn't really play well. You tell them, oh, that was so good. You did so well, you know. And, and, and you know, when they fall and they get, uh, uh, you know, they get hurt, you know, no matter how minor it is, you go there, you want to encourage them. Are you okay? Are you okay? And sometimes they fall, they don't really get that injured. But if nobody is talking or encouraging them, they yell like it's, they need an ambulance. Oh, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. You know, because they want that, you know, it's about family and Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. Did you see that in your Bible? Read it there. We can read right there. They did not believe in him. So he faced rejection at home, and then he also faced rejection among the people that he had been a blessing to. In John chapter 6, verse 66, the Bible says that all a multitude of disciples who followed him turned away from him. They stopped following him because they said, you know, this message you've been preaching about eating your flesh and drinking, that is too hard for us. All we want is for you to take somebody's lunch here, hocus pocus, boom, and there's food for everybody. That's what we want to see. That's what we are interested in. You've been preaching. Mister, we will listen to your preaching, but please multiply food for us. But he said, no, 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 I have something more important than the bread and the fish that you ate last time. Let's talk about those important things. The Bible says, from that time, many of his disciples no longer, what? what? They turned away from him. That's why sometimes, you know, people get so discouraged about, uh, you know, the, the, the things that happen in church, the politics that happen in church, the pain that happens, at, you know, even. These have always been. Because as long as there are, there are human beings on the planet, pain isn't going to go away. In fact, we cause pain for the planet itself. That's the first thing. So rejection. Rejection must drive us to God. And there's nobody here in this room who will tell me they've not faced rejection at one point or the other. Is it from parents? Is it from siblings? Is it from co-workers? Is it from... So let, me, let me define rejection for you. Just, just watch this, okay? The ex, uh, social rejection or private rejection that's within a family occurs when an individual is deliberately excluded from a social relationship or social interaction. And it happens in church. That's one thing we always pray. Felicia and I pray, and and, even leaders when we pray together, we always pray against that. Because when you have a church that has cliques, have you ever been to a church where there are cliques? Oh, Oh my goodness. It doesn't matter how big or how small. People think it's only in smaller churches that there are cliques. No. If you have, you can have a, a mega church, but it has cliques. People that they have sworn into relationship unbeknownst to them, and they knock other people out. So when you try to join and be friends, they say, oh, who are you? <laughs> Some are like that, stiff arm, all the time. They don't want to. So the, it, 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 it happens. And people feel rejected, and they don't want to go back there. I don't want that to be, uh, uh, there's no church I have led where we, 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 we fight that. You see, my job as a minister is to turn the people outward all the time. Turning outward. Because it's very easy for us to begin to look inward. Joy Fountain was becoming like that. We're becoming so inward, we're comfortable the way we are, our size, our income, everything. Yeah. But we, ha- we have to keep turning everyone outward. Look outward. Don't only look at yourselves. That's why we don't want our small groups to just become a place where it's just us, 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 us. No, we don't want that. We must always keep looking at because it's very easy to reject people and you don't even know you've done it. Church bullying also happens. When we bully people without knowing we bully them. Actually, leaders are bullied a lot. (laughs) Because you don't want anybody to leave. But you know, I'm not, I have learned not to. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not afraid of people leaving or people saying anything bad about me. Uh, It doesn't matter because at the end, God will vindicate me if I was right. And it's not about being right. It's about pointing out. This is, see, leadership, you have to chart a course. Sometimes the course will cost you. But it's better it costs us now than become a, a dam that is leaky. Because eventually it will break. 
Rejection will happen. If you, have, if you don't want rejection, don't go into leadership. And when I'm saying leadership, I don't mean, I don't mean church. Whether in education, in, 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 in uh, finance, in, 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 in medicine, any, whatever field, law, what, where, wherever you've been called to, please, if you don't want to, you think because you're a leader, you have a lot of money, you make a good salary, people will not reject you. People are just people. So rejection must drive us to the place of God. Husbands reject their wives. Wives reject their husbands. And, you know, it, it can be very painful. I'm not here to talk about how we will deal with rejection, the details. But the first place to deal with rejection is to run into the arms of the person who accepts you. And I know a heavenly father who accepts you just the way you are. Amen? Do I hear an amen? You see, the experience of rejection can lead to a number of adverse psychological consequences, such as loneliness, low self-esteem, aggression, and depression. And there's a lot of people in our society today who feel low esteem. Why do, they, do we want them to come into the church and then we further give them that same treatment or at the door? We just treat them like they are nobodies. No. Love people. Bless people. Engage people. Love on them. Sometimes you love on them, it doesn't mean that people are going to change. It doesn't mean that people are not going to still reject you. It doesn't mean people are not going to treat you bad. But we must draw the line. We must be loving. We must be accommodating. We must open our arms wide. We must also watch for when the enemy seeks to take advantage of the flock and deal with that. And Jesus did that. The second thing I think, when I look at Jesus' life, I believe that pain was another factor that ensured that he kept in line. Remember, Jesus was fully God and fully human. And the scripture shows us his human side so much. I'll get into that a little bit uh, further. But uh, pain, the, the pain of false accusation. Have you ever been falsely accused? It doesn't leave you. God may heal you, but you don't forget. When you see the person who falls, it's very painful. It might even be over a small matter. You don't easily forget that. It's not even something that people easily get over. False accusation. Because it rids you of every self-respect. You have to be careful to manage yourself. Otherwise, you can lose it. False accusation. That's why people sometimes commit suicide when they've been falsely accused. They know. They alone know and God that they didn't do anything wrong. In uh, John 10, 20, they said of Jesus, he has a demon. <laughs> Think about it for a while. Here you are trying to help people. You just healed somebody. You cast demons out. You walked on the sea. You, and then somebody comes, who has heard all about the miracles? You have said, he has a demon. And you know the people who said that? It was the Pharisees. Because they were jealous. When Jesus came to the temple and he started his ministry, all the people who were going to hear him, they didn't hear the Pharisees anymore. And the Sadducees and the scribes. You know why? Because when the Pharisees and scribes were preaching, this is what they did. <laughs> I mean, who wants to hear that? Who wants to hear that? But the people had no alternative. So they go every week to the, to the synagogue. Then they collect their money, put it in the pocket. Next week again. Then somebody comes along and is speaking. I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, that's it. Resurrection. Whoever follows me, I will give. That's it. If you believe in me, out of your belly shall flow rivers. We're talking about rivers here. Pictures are being painted. Destinies are being formed. No, blah, 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 blah. Uh, where's everybody? Oh, they're over there listening to the man. And you know, Jesus is very interesting. The Bible says he stood by the treasury where the money was collected. Some of you don't know Jesus. When you, if I give a teaching on money, Jesus and money, Jesus actually stood by the treasury infuriating the Pharisees the more and the scribes because ah, why are you preaching and people are listening to you and you are standing by the treasury he was connecting to their heart and their hearts to their pocket <laughs> so the money left the synagogue and followed Jesus Luke chapter 8 verse 1 to 3 read it you see where the money went that's why he needed somebody to care for the money Judas and when Judas saw the money was so much he said if I take a little bit at a time nobody will notice <laughs> So he wanted to build a very nice condo and rent some out. He was settling himself. It was a lot of money. You need to read between the lines when you read the scripture. And may God help us read between the lines. Not to add to it, but to learn from it. Friends, <laughs> pain. Jesus, when somebody you love that, and you care for betrays you, he says, stab in the back. 
Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 says that Jesus was acquainted with grief. What does it mean? Some of you don't know. Have you ever heard about Joseph throughout the scriptures? Bible scholars say, I tend to agree, that Joseph may have died somewhere along the line. Because anytime you see, they say Mary and her brothers. Your mother and your brothers are here. Where was Joseph? Was he too busy in his store? So I think there was a reason why the prophet wrote he was acquainted with grief. Jesus had grief around him. That's why if you really want to come into the ministry, you will see grief. People will give you grief. But there will also be people who will give you joy. I'm telling you, it, it's, you will see that. You know, if you enter into a business, <laughs> before you earn your first million, you will see some grief. People will try to steal from you. If you say, well, let me buy a property and rent it out to people and make a lot of money. On paper, it looks very good. But the tenants aren't going to tell you they will remove your doors put it in their pickup truck and go just to get even with you. <laughs> but then you face those things, right? Okay, so number three is direction. If you have gone through rejection and pain, you think you can have direction? You are rejected. <laughs> pain hits you on this side. How do you get direction? How do you get, when, when you, nobody, I mean, everybody's slapping you left, right, and center. You can't see it straight. But thank God for God. If you run to him in the place of prayer, you get direction. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 38, the disciples said to Jesus, people are waiting for you. Let's go and, and, and have another nice crusade from what you did yesterday. He says, no. I just finished my prayer with my father. I'm supposed to go to the other towns. What we did here yesterday was very, very good. But we need to go over there now. Because that's why I came. That's why I came. He got direction. I hope you understand that Jesus was not feeling all so great and joyful all the time when people spit at him. When people treated him bad. He knew what to do. And he gave us the example. Go to your father in the secret place. The human side of him felt the pain. Because the Bible told us he was hungry. The Bible told us he asked the woman by the well, give me to drink. The Bible says he was tired, he slept in the boat. The storm was even going, he didn't even know. They had to wake him up. Master, wake up or we, we perish. Number four is consistency. If you get direction, it's easier to be consistent. Because you have direction. When you don't have direction... People will say you are not consistent because you are here, say, oh, sorry, I'm off. There are so many people today who have no direction. But when we come to the place of prayer, he helps us to iron out the details and gives us connection. It's much needed if you've been rocked by pain and rejection. Number five is strength. There is a strength that is not seen. It's called spiritual strength. If you are strong in your spirit, you'll be strong physically. In Matthew 8, 23 to 27, we see Jesus sleeping, right? And then he wakes up and he speaks to the storm. That's spiritual strength. He became a dam to the storm. He hit the wall and went back down and calmed. That roaring, raging spirit calmed down because of spiritual strength. And we can't build spiritual strength if we don't go into the place of prayer. Number six is fellowship. 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 You know, Adam lost fellowship on behalf of mankind. Romans chapter 5 tells us that through one man, sin came into the world. And through that one man, condemnation upon all men, all mankind. So now we find Adam, uh, Jesus Christ is like the second Adam. God has to do what he did in the Garden of Eden. But this time around, he comes through this woman called Mary, sinless, so that he can do, he can succeed where Adam failed. And he did. So when the serpent came to him in the wilderness and offered him all that he offers the politicians of today, because many politicians are offered that, right? When you become the head of state or the prime minister, then we go, ha ha, now you are in power. You see, Remember what we said the other day? If you will do this, I will give you this. And that's why many rulers do evil. 
But they are good rulers, right? They are good people. That's why the church has to pray. The Bible says we should pray for all those in authority that we might have peace. People always wonder, why do politicians so nice make all these promises and then they call politicians liars? Have you noticed? And John chapter 8 verse 44 says, the devil when he speaks, he speaks from lies. Because he's the father of what? Lies. But the reason why politicians are that way is that they are human. The Bible says, watch and pray lest you what? Fall into temptation. We have to pray for them. We have to pray for those in authority. Because they are easily, they can easily say, <laughs> watch and pray lest you enter. Which means the politicians who have no prayer covering can easily enter. It's a temp they just enter. There's no will to resist. That's why we have to pray for them. The Bible says we should pray for them that we might have peace. Why? So that they don't do something that will take our peace away. Make rules and laws that take our peace away. And people wonder, what's wrong? And he was so nice when he was campaigning. He was eating and drinking beer with us and eating fries and everything. Why is he so mean now? Because something else takes over. Because the devil is very hungry for governmental powers of the world. That's why churches must be governing in nature, governing in approach, governing in, 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 in what we do. Because we are an extension of a government. Did you know that? Yeah. So what was lost in Eden, the second Adam brought. Jesus demonstrated it. Okay, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, we have fellowship with him and with God. Last but not the least is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. When, when we come into the place of prayer, we come to give thanks. I believe every time Jesus went to pray, often he would give thanks. You know how I know? I'll show you. In John chapter 6, when he would break the bread, as soon as he got the bread and the fish, you know what he did? He, he gave thanks. See, what he does in secret is what he does in public. I believe that he approached, and you remember he's the word. And the Bible says, I will enter his gates with what? With thanksgiving in my heart. I then will enter his courts with praise. If you look at his prayer in John 17, what does he say? He said, I praise you, righteous father, for you have heard me. I thank you, righteous father. He says, I pray for these ones, but I do not pray for them alone. I also pray for those who have, who will believe in them. So Jesus already prayed for you 2,000 years ago. Guess what? That prayer will, will, will come to pass in your life in Jesus' name. That's why there's no excuse for us to fail. And this is why even when people fall as Christians, don't kick them down there because they can still rise up. The falling, you see, the church is the only one who shoots their soldiers after they fall. We must come together and know that we can do it. We can win in the name of Jesus Christ. You can win because he already prayed for you. And if there's any prayer that I believe God will answer, it's Jesus' prayer. He said, I pray for them also who will believe in their word. Thanksgiving. Jesus, if you see, he said, where are the ten, where are the other nine, right? The ten lepers. He said, where are the other nine? Only one came back to give thanks. How many of us will come back to give thanks? How many of us do that? Even today as you drive home, will you give thanks? You know, in Canada, we complain a lot about what we shouldn't even complain about. We are so blessed. Somebody say with me, we're so blessed in this country. You know, you know and, and like I said, next year we start something where we'll be sending money to certain mission fields. We'll raise the money. We'll do something to raise money. Um, this year we are doing, we are so blessed. If we just sit down and don't do anything, we will, already we give to missions as a church, but we want to actually engage our sweat equity in towards, you know, not for ourselves, but for, you know, other places, you know. We've been told about Cuba from the CNBC. They've shared us, uh, two years ago, I was, we were introduced to Cuba, but we've not done anything. We've been working with World Vision for the last couple of years, but uh, many of you are not involved. You don't even know what, where the money you give, how it's spent as far as mission is concerned. But it, you, we want to be involved. We want to do things that would, you know, uh, touch lives far away from where we are, and we will hear the reports of what God is doing. But we have to be thankful. And one of the ways of being thankful, that's why I'm saying this, is, is giving of ourselves. But we can't do this. If our eyes are blind by rejection, our tears have blocked our view because of pain, and we have lost direction, and there's no consistency, and we are weak in our strength, and we don't even want fellowship, 
because we are weak in strength. And then it's difficult to say thank you because this mountain, this molehill has become a mountain. The enemy has spoken a lie and said, ah, you can't overcome. Here we are today. We can start from the end by giving thanks and then going back up. Because the Bible says we should give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. So we'll start there. So I want you to kind of push away all the difficulties. I'm not saying that we don't have difficulties in Canada. There are difficulties. There are stresses. One of the stresses, bill stresses. Because they tell you, sign up for this. It's just $20 a month. You say, oh, that's okay. I'll tell you, oh, I can do that. Sign up for this. It's just $5.99 a month plus tax. Okay. All right. Another one. Oh, no. Just get this cable. And it's just $7.99 plus tax. And before you know it, oh, my goodness. The tax is alone. Oh. They say we are taxed to death, isn't it? But we, we will not die under taxes. But not just that. The stresses, there are those stresses, the trying to raise kids, trying to, yeah, you know, something goes wrong with your car when you're not expecting it. Oh, this car now. You're not allowed to swear, so you don't. And then you take the car in, and it's $600. For what? Well, our labor is $90 an hour. This would take three hours to do. The parts are unused. Everything is right before you, but it's $600. Well, I don't, $600? Yeah. These things. There are stresses, I know. But can we put, push those aside this morning? Let's start from the end. Thanksgiving. Because actually, Thanksgiving is the beginning. Say with me, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Bow your head with me for a minute.